Hello, uh, this is David Dornish from GAO. Welcome to our webinar for today. This is GAO's centennial webinar on managing complexity across public policy challenges. Before we get into the meat of the panel, uh, a few housekeeping things for you. First off, regarding the Zoom meeting, um, you won't be visible on Zoom. Your names won't even uh, come up. And, but you can use the chat box and we can reply to you, uh, to the audience. You can, the audience, you can use your chat box and we panelists can also interact with you by chat. But your video, your, your audio is muted and you won't be able to say anything uh, during the panel. This uh, video, the, this, this webinar is being recorded and subsequent to the session, it will become available on GAO's website. Now, uh, before we get into the actual uh, presentations and discussion, uh, we'd like to uh, play for you a short video from GAO's Com Comptroller General, Gene Dodaro. Hello, I'm Gene Dodaro, Comptroller General of the United States and head of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. 2021 marks GAO's 100th anniversary serving Congress and the American people. As part of our centennial celebration, we are pleased to present this webinar series called Foundations for Accountability, Oversight Issues for the Next 100 Years. We rely on a deep pool of expertise within and outside the agency to help monitor changes in public policy and management. In addition to our own people at GAO, we also consult with advisory panels, such as the Comptroller General's Educators Advisory Panel, independent researchers, and agency managers who implement the policies and programs we audit. We are proud to bring these experts together for webinars covering the following topics. Leading practices to manage, empower, and oversee the federal workforce. Building integrated portfolios of evidence for decision-making. Managing complexity across public policy challenges. The legal context of accountability and major challenges for the next 100 years. These webinars will explore the goals, conflicts, tensions, and challenges that shape the need for rigorous evidence-based decision-making to improve government and support oversight. They will highlight promising and effective practices that can help achieve these goals and demonstrate what GAO has done and will continue to do to support an effective economical, efficient, equitable, and ethical federal government. I hope you will find them informative. Please enjoy. Hello, my name is David Dornish and I will be moderating this panel. First, I want to thank the Comptroller General for his introduction and our panelists for agreeing to participate in this webinar series. I also want to thank the many people who have been working for more than a year to plan for and make this and the other events that Mr. Dodaro just mentioned happen with a special thanks to Mandy Pritchard and Bro Brody Garner for leadership in the series. As Gene mentioned in his remarks, GAO combines a variety of expertise and evidence from scholarship and practice and believes that one of GAO's biggest strengths is its effort to hear from a wide range of stakeholders and seriously follow the evidence where it leads. As Gene mentioned, aside from today's panel, we've done uh, three others and there's one more to come actually. Um, but today's panel, again, is called uh, Managing Complexity Across Public Policy Challenge, Challenges. 
This panel grew out of an idea to explore in a centennial panel the ways that administrators, policymakers, and researchers can use technology and analytics tools to evaluate and effectively manage the increasingly complex and cross-cutting issues that government is faced with in areas such as emergency management, climate, transportation, cybersecurity, immigration, and many others. <clears throat> Like many areas that GAO works in, this topic could, of course, easily span more than 90 minutes. For today, we have a really interesting panel of speakers, each of whom comes at these issues of complexity, management, and analytics from different angles. Specifically, we have three GAO panelists and three external researchers. The order of presentation and the basic topics are as follows. And I'm going to share my screen to give you a list of the panelists. Our first presentation, it will be by Chris Kaliba, the uh, professor at the University of Vermont in the Community Development and Applied economics department. Chris is going to set the stage conceptually and empirically for the pa panel, presenting ideas from his extensive research in the areas of complexity science, public management, and data analytics and machine learning. Uh, the second presenter will be GAO's chief data scientist and the director of GAO's data innovation lab, Taka Ariga, and he will provide some, some uh, computer demonstrations of current machine learning and artificial intelligence applications at GAO. Our third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth speakers will be talk, speaking more topically about specific areas of research that they're involved in. The, uh, David Trimble will be our third speaker. He is the managing director of GAO's physical infrastructure team. And he'll present on auditing and risk assessment under complexity in areas like environmental cleanup and transportation infrastructure. The fourth uh, speaker is Matt Auer, pr professor and dean of the University of Georgia's School of Public and International Affairs. And his topic will be managing wildfire, urgency, complexity, and equity. Fifth, Chris Curry, a director in GAO's Homeland Security and Justice team, is going to present on the extensive work that GAO has done in the area of national preparedness, emergency management, national biodefense, and related topics. And his title is Complexity and Fragmentation in National Preparedness. Uh, finally, we have Brian Gerber, professor at the Arizona State University, College of Public Service and Community so Solutions. His title is Practice Improvement in Disaster Risk Reduction and Community Resilience Capacity Building. So I'm just going to open up the presentations now. And as I said, the first speaker is Chris Kaliba. Chris Kaliba is the inaugural director of the University of Vermont Office of Engagement and a full professor in the Community Development and Applied Economics Department at UVM. He is the co-director of the Social Ec Ecological Gaming and Simulation Lab there and served as their director of Master of Public Administration program from 2002 to 2020. He's a lead author on, of a book on, uh, called Governance Network in Public Administration and Public Policy, and has published many, many uh, peer-reviewed articles, as well as led efforts on over 50 million in grants from federal agencies. With that, I will pass it over to Chris to tell us about data science and simulations. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for sure. that introduction. Uh, I'm now going to be taking over the screen and starting in on my presentation. It's an honor to be invited to participate in today's panel. Uh, and David, I've, I've known David for a very long time and appreciate this opportunity to take another bite at the apple 
with the uh, GAO community and talk about uh, data science and simulation methods and what methodological advances can be employed to track uh, government performance. So the, the lens for this panel is uh, framed around complexity. And uh, we have grown our, in our understandings about com complex systems, complex adaptive systems over time, um, as our degrees of certainty and uncertainty um, ebb and flow from high to low, um, as well as our degrees of agreement on the nature of the problems, the scope of the problems, and obviously, most importantly, consensus around problems. And of course, uh, our understanding of complexity, though, has, uh, has been driven in part by advances in our computational capacities. Um, and so that's where I'm interested in uh, today's presentations and looking at how some of the methodological advances computationally um, can drive our understanding of government's performance in this complex uh, environment. And of course, from a policy science standpoint, um, we are very much interested in this concept called wicked problems. This is a, not, a, not a term just based out of Boston, but a, uh, a term of art in the planning and policy world to basically um, define a scope of problems that have no clear definitions, um, are often unique, um, are not easily solved or solved with, with at, at all. Um, there's no stopping rules, et cetera, et cetera. And today's uh, panelists are all gonna be talking about areas in which wicked problems persist, including emergency management, uh, water management, um, and COVID pandemic, all of which I've had my own research um, focusing on all, some, on all these topics. As I mentioned, uh, computational uh, methods have been advanced over the last several decades. Uh, and there's uh, many frameworks for understanding these. Um, here's a very common one that's found and you look at complex systems uh, and, the, and the, the parameters around emergence and self-organization of, of complex adaptive systems and the range of uh, approaches and methods from game theory to systems theory to, to nonlinear modeling, um, pattern formation and whatnot um, that are now revolutionary revolutionizing um, our understanding and our approach to researching um, public policy and, and government performance. There have been maps of laid out uh, around the history of complexity science. I won't get into this very complicated uh, timelines, but I will highlight for us right now, um, just in the last several decades that we see um, advances in network science, of which David um, has pioneered in GAO. Um, to the big data science revolution um, that is now leading to uh, complexity in, in policy understandings, as well as the uh, interdisciplinarity of, of these methods and the ability to couple uh, human and natural systems, um, human and technological systems in some very creative and innovative ways that you're likely to be hearing more of today. Uh, I also wanna point us to uh, some seminal work that's been done at the federal level um, this by the National Science and Technology Council on the, uh, the future of artificial intelligence research um, that's been updated, uh, subsequently updated, but the roots are, are in 2016 with the Obama administration. Um, and in that document, it lays out uh, both the promises and potential fit pitfalls of using artificial intelligence to study and advance um, innovation and, and studies of, of government programming writ large um, and public policy, more, more importantly. Uh, one of the major revolutionary uh, drivers of in artificial intelligence is something that Taka I know will be speaking on, and that is uh, machine learning. Um, and some members of the audience may not be as familiar of, of what machine learning techniques um, allow us to do that we had not had uh, before. Um, it allows you to process very large data sets um, and do a number of different functions. Um, some would argue that some of these functions have been able to be applied through uh, traditional statistical methods, but, but not at the scale that we can do with machine learning. Um, new classification approaches, more advanced uh, modalities for regression analysis, um, advances in cluster analysis um, that we have not had a, an opportunity to, uh, to do before, um, multidimensionality um, and, and ranking and, and listing. And so these these techniques um, have really, although they've been around for a while um, and the outcomes of these, of these techniques have been around for a while, the ability to take large scales of data 
um, potentially from multiple data sources, um, is really revolutionizing our field. In terms of applications, uh, we see applications in natural language processing, um, ideas around computer visualization um, and visualization techniques, um, detections of anomalies, those outliers, those small tail um, anomalies that can actually lead to black swan events and of, of, are obviously of critical importance for emergency management and homeland security. Um, we're able to do some very sophisticated time series analysis, um, as well as some projections in terms of, of uh, recommending best practices, uh, best services. And of course, these are all practices that uh, are being done to us and with us whenever we jump on uh, social media. And uh, it's time now that we're taking, need to be taking advantage of that um, for processing and evaluating government, government performance and public policies. Of course, there are a number of frameworks to be thinking about relative to the role of AI um, in human beings, um, AI performing functions alongside of human beings. And so some examples you'll hear today from Taka, for example, um, fall into this category. Um, we're beginning to see more and more though, and, and as the crystal ball shows, uh, us, we're going to have more AI performing functions to reduce uh, human cognitive burden and overloads. Um, and then to eventually that AI functions will perform in lieu of human beings. Um, this is a reality that uh, is basing us. Um, the question is, do we, as we embrace these approaches, um, how do we do it ethically, uh, morally, um, effectively, um, and in ways and manners that uh, the human agency and the uh, accountability uh, signals um, remain intact, which are obviously critical in democratic societies such as ours. A couple things relative to, to the simulation side of this, in, to, in addition to machine learning, um, just some basic concepts uh, that have been around with us for a very long time uh, in terms of systems theory and cybernetics theories, um, but understanding uh, the relationship between inputs and outputs, um, stock and flows, um, capturing these relationships in dynamic uh, feedback and feed forward mechanisms um, can allow us to be able to potentially render better understandings of the relationship between causality um, and, and uh, regression and uh, correlation, um, as well as to do more anticipatory um, simulations that look at, let's say, changes in inputs um, and, in, and changes in alterations in feedback systems. An additional uh, simulation modeling approach that's uh, revolutionizing our approaches is, is a concept called agent-based modeling. Um, it allows us to model how different agents, and they, these could be human agents, these could be constructs and concepts, these could be um, facilities, um, and allows us to uh, study the interaction effects um, and allow for uh, the study of emergent uh, characteristics and qualities. And these methodologies uh, can be used to actually formulate uh, actual concrete public policy renderings. And I'm just highlighting very quickly here a, a recent publication and a model that my colleague Patrick Bitterman and I uh, published in uh, the Journal of American Public Administration Theory and Research and Theory. Um, it's an agent-based model um, that was in partnership with policymakers at the state level, in, in, this is in Vermont. And the, the wicked problem here was water quality, um, we were approached by uh, the Secretary of Natural Resources to, with questions, they want to know how much money to spend, what's the appropriate scale of coordination, um, and how can we use and allocate uh, human resources to achieve, in this case, reduction of harmful algal blooms. And interestingly enough, uh, the model that I'll quickly just mention here re resulted in a piece of public policy and legislation called Act 76, um, which invented and created uh, clean water service providers um, uh, framework for, for regional watershed governance. Um, what, we what we did is we put together an agent-based model that looked at um, these different scenarios, um, acting alone, um, creating planning districts and planning um, and, and implementation districts um, and simulating what if scenarios in, in this kind of construct. Um, this is an example of how we can use uh, uh, model development uh, to develop simulations, to develop optimization. Um, and what it does is circumvents the, uh, it still is a need to actually actively experiment with policy design, but this allows you to do it in a simulated environment to test out alternative um, solutions, working collaboratively with stakeholders, in this case of GAO, it's, it's, your, it's your partnering government agencies to try out different policy designs and perspectives 
uh, before it gets in, uh, implemented. And so this is just an output uh, from this particular model. Uh, and what it basically suggested is that mandated planning and implementation districts for watershed management and water quality management in our region um, was, uh, was the best route um, to increase uh, load um, nutrient load reductions. Um, they followed our advice and, and again, implemented Act 76. So what we have here today um, is a series of talks that lay out um, wicked problems and our approaches to doing so. Um, and I'm now pleased uh, to turn it back to David and uh, we'll be looking to uh, circle back in terms of the discussion role and uh, ask questions of the panelists relative to some of these methodological advances that are before us. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, so I am now going to hand it over to Taka to uh, just um, Taka Ariga. And uh, Taka is the chief data scientist appointed by the Comptroller General of the United States for Government Accountability Office. He also leads GAO's newly established innovation lab in driving problem-centric experiments across audit and operational teams through novel use of advanced analytics and emergency, emerging technologies. As a member of the Senior Executive Service, Taka is also responsible for working with GAO stakeholders to adopt prospective views on oversight impacts of emerging capabilities such as AI, cloud services, blockchains, RPA, 5G, and Internet of Things. Uh, Taka is natively fluent in both Japanese and Mandarin Chinese in his spare time. He is also a serious classical chamber musician and a competitive tennis player. I'll hand it off to you now, Taka. Thank you. Thank you, David. And it's such a you know, great pleasure to be with the Centennial webinar audience today. Uh, I have to say, selfishly speaking, I, I, I see sort of my role within GAO as having one of the most fun jobs. Um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with Chris. We certainly live in a very complicated world with many, many uh, wicked problems to sort of address. And, and this is really why GAO established the Innovation Lab, is really to have a prospective and forward-looking view on a range of emerging technologies, whether those are AI driven, whether those are blockchain, whether those are cloud services, whether those are Internet of Things, 5G, et cetera. Um, the, the kind of a duality that GAO embodies uh, represent not only the kind of oversight, insight, foresight questions that we need to answer on behalf of the United States Congress, but also how do we ourselves take advantage of these capabilities so that we can drive our mission delivery uh, operational work with much uh, more sort of depth and, and, and sort of breadth in terms of our capacity. So from an innovation lab perspective, this is really taking a, a computational focus around a range of uh, emerging capability, really try to understand the oversight implication of these technologies. Uh, so AI is a good example of that. Uh, we very recently published uh, the first of its kind AI accountability framework. And the goal really is to take many of these high level principles around uh, ethical considerations and transparency, explainability, and some of the negative societal impacts, uh, pushing down those principles down to a set of practices questions, and more specifically, an audit perspective set of procedure when it comes to evaluating artificial intelligence solutions. But at the same time, we, you know, within Innovation Lab, we have uh, a number of projects uh, that we're developing what we call minimally viable products or prototypes to really experiment different facets of AI and how they can help us as an agency do our jobs better. And so today, I kind of want to spend some time to really showcase a couple of examples of these prototypes to give you a sense on how active we are in terms of exploring these technical depth uh, and but how we also uh, working across our partners at the international level, state and local level, but also at the federal level, uh, and collectively addressing some of these wicked problems when it comes to uh, emerging technologies. So the first uh, prototype I want to showcase, uh, you know, this is really talking to 
um, a, a different form in, in which we convey a timely set of information. So specifically, this is around Operation Warp Speed. Uh, we stood up this dashboard back in January of this year when the vaccines themselves were just coming online. So this is an example where there's a lot of complicated sciences to sort through. There's certainly a lot of complicated policy issues to sort through. So how do we make the evolving data available and consumable to the general public out there to support uh, you know, trust in science, to support uh, the, the availability of vaccines? So this is a, a different way on than how GAO traditionally have developed our um, oversight products. So this is much more interactive driven. So in terms of, you can take a look at the Pfizer vaccine, for example. So we looked at the technology readiness ass assessment, AA out of nine in this case. So that should convey a level of maturity around how this particular vaccine was developed in terms of a review that it went through, in terms of a platform. And as tech, uh, the data uh, themselves evolve, we contemporaneously updated information uh, in this sort of a digital format and interactive format so that um, the public can sort of in a timely way understand uh, different types of vaccines that are coming online, uh, the maturity of those platform, and then can make really informed decision relative to um, uh, in, in terms of how we can collectively address some of these pandemic uh, mitigation strategy. Another sort of examples that we want to show, and, and uh, Chris talked about the power of simulation. Um, you know, we certainly live in a complicated world where resource constraints are sort of everywhere. You know, we don't have unlimited budgets. We certainly don't have unlimited people or um, uh, sort of scope of technology. So one of the key challenges that GAO has always been uh, working through is the, uh, the concept of improper payments, uh, you know, money that has gone out of the, the federal government government that should not have otherwise. Uh, one of the key uh, sort of mitigation strategy that we were exploring is how identity verification might actually help uh, mitigate the growth of improper payments, which, you know, if you sort of take last year as a yardstick, last year alone was $206 billion. And that is before we accounted for uh, many of the pandemic relief uh, funding floating out there. Um, so, but understanding that we can't just implement the most stringent controls out there uh, because a lot of sort of vulnerable socioeconomic uh, citizens are don't necessarily have access to, let's say, smartphone or having access to digital credential. Um, and similarly, you know, a lot of these controls are still uh, very expensive from a cost implementation perspective. So given these set of uh, constraints, what are some of the key trade-offs that individual agency can toggle and understand the impacts. So this is a, a prototype of a simulation tool where on the left-hand side, we allow the user to characterize the kind of programs they're running. So for example, uh, what is the social economic, economic vulnerability of the population that they're serving? Is it balanced? Is it less vulnerable? Is it more vulnerable? Uh, so you, know, you can sort of toggle around that. And then the kind of control based on our expert panel recommendation that are available, whether it's uniform methods, risk-based methods, um, and, and there are other parameters that can be adjusted. Um, the, the, the long story short here is this particular simulation tool allows you to see the different trade-offs. So for example, based on a couple of uh, controls that I selected, we are looking at potentially preventing 93% of improper payments. Yay for us, that's a really good news. But at the same time, because of the level of control that we implemented, we are also uh, deterring 37% of legitimate payments. That is perhaps not such a great news, right? Um, and then, so if you take a look at this chart here, uh, the way that we are running the simulation is to really articulate the potential trade-offs between legitimate payments made, legitimate payments stopped or deter improper payments stop or deter and improper payments made. So those are the, the sort of four pillars that we're trying to balance relative to this type of policy uh, wicked problem that we're trying to solve. And then we also include elements such as budgetary constraints. So in this example, 
uh, the totality of the cost uh, relative to individual user is roughly thirteen hundred dollars. Um, you know, there may be some additional constraint at the sort of different state and locality level that may not necessarily make this type of control possible. And then you can sort of look at if I choose different type of control, my you know the simulation will run in real time to understand the kind of key trade off. In this case, we went to a risk based model. The cost has significantly grown. But the proportion of improper payments prevented versus the legitimate payments deter is much more reasonable. So there are a number of these controls here that can be toggled to really show the trade off decisions necessary to implement a lot of these recommendations that are being put forth. Um, the third example I'll showcase uh, this is really more about how can we. Uh, be more collaborative with our congressional stakeholders and be more responsive to the kind of conversations that are happening on the Hill. And this is an example where GAO developed our own topic modeling using natural language processing, as opposed to going to a, a commercial solution, because what we were able to develop in-house was actually performing better, scaling better, and, and much more adaptive to the, the kind of uh, audit reports that GAO generates. So this is another example of that prototype, looking at all of the conversations that are happening across various committees, you know, whether there's press releases, whether those are hearings. Uh, so every night we essentially scrape that information apply our own topic modeling uh, capability to say, has GAO ever covered uh, uh, so, you know, issue report around the kind of topics that are being discussed? So I'll give an example. Let's say I'm interested in the concept of telecom, right? So on, on the sort of left side of the screen talks about all of the conversations that have recently happened related to the concept of of telecom. And the, on the right hand side are all of the matching geo reports that specifically uh, are relevant to the, the concept of telecom. And so this is one way for us to be contemporaneous as we see these um, you know, topics are surfacing. How do we sort of be responsive to our congressional stakeholders? Conversely, if there are specific topics with no GAO reports, those potentially become a, a sort of potential areas that GAO could cover. So it also helps us uh, sort of provide coverage around so, sort of opportunity for us to issue uh, additional sort of oversight products on, on those topics as well. So this is a, 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 a really good example of we started with a very problem-centered approach in terms of needing to develop our own topic models, but quickly organically grew that topic modeling capability to help us to be much more responsive to the legislative agenda, to uh, some of the uh, you know, technical assistance requests that are coming out of the Hill, uh, but really keeping the pulses to uh, our, our key uh, committees of jurisdiction in terms of how GAO can better serve them. Uh, there are uh, the, you know, about two dozen or so uh, uh, sort of other prototypes that we're working on, but just wanted to really quickly showcase some of the work that's been done by Innovation Lab. Really, it, it's the, the idea here is for us to have much more forward-looking and computationally driven capability to help GAO meet its very unique pan-governmental mission in terms of our oversight, insight, and foresight function. So hopefully that gave you a sort of a preview on some of the work that we're working on. And with that, David, I'm gonna turn it back to you. So, hi, um, thanks very much, Taka. That's really interesting stuff. And um, we're gonna to move to our next speaker now, uh, David Trimble. Uh, David is the Managing Director of GAO's Physical Infrastructure Team. He joined the Physical Infrastructure Team as a Director in April 2020, where he led work on the U.S. Postal Service and federal buildings and other assets. Prior to joining Physical Infrastructure, David directed a body of work on, in NRE on nuclear weapons, nonproliferation and cleanup, and clean water. His work produced numerous recommendations and financial accomplishments concerning the management of large capital projects and the handling of nuclear waste. <clears throat> David has presented before Congress on a wide range of issues and has presented GAO's work before numerous organizations such as the International Atomic Energy Agency and the National Academy of Sciences. He holds an MA in policy analysis from the University of Chicago 
and a BA in philosophy, philosophy from Lawrence University. Take it away, David. All right, well, thank you very much, David, and thank you for uh, having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, some distinguished colleagues. Uh, I'm not used to being in such great and august company, so I appreciate the, <laughs> the opportunity. Hey, uh, I'm going to uh, change the focus a little bit uh, on the discussion of complexity, uh, just to take it from the perspective of the uh, something I know a little bit about from the auditor's perspective, because um, complexity is a challenge, obviously, for program managers, but it's also a, a huge challenge for the evaluation and the accountability community. To go to the next slide, please. And one of the things I've seen um, over the years is, com is complexity certainly is a growing uh, challenge uh, for program managers and auditors. Um, and there are sort of two themes I think uh, that I've seen during my career uh, it, that's behind this. One is, I mean, because if you go back 20, 30 years, the problems were complex, right? It's not, it's not like those were simple times, right? The, the problems were still complex. But I think what's, what's changed largely has been, um, in, in some ways, the, there was a growing recognition, at least in the auditing community, that uh, we needed new approaches and sort of uh, more comprehensive, complex methodologies to tackle the problems we had been looking at. I think there was a growing recognition that uh, some of the issues and challenges and findings we we're fi having um, were sticking around, even though we'd made numerous recommendations. So they were persistent, and they weren't weren't sort of uh, being responsive to our traditional approaches. Um, and so in the 80s and 90s, there was a, just an increasing emphasis for audits to consider to sort of a, to, to expand their scope and look at the bigger picture and consider problems and their causes in a larger context to hope to make progress in, in tackling these larger, pro these larger problems. And I, I remember uh, vividly uh, on more than one occasion being lectured by uh, Nancy Kingsbury, who was sort of uh, one of the uh, legends in GAO from a, on the methodological side, uh, lecturing folks about uh, embracing contextual sophistication in their work, which I uh, took as, uh, you know, as a advice that you need to you need to get out of your foxhole when you're looking and assessing problems and consider the whole system and its complexity if you're going to have any recommendations that are worth their salt um, and the other thing i would note on complexity in terms of how it's changed over the years is sometimes complexity emerges on an old problem not so much that the problem changes as much as what we as a country and a society view as an acceptable solution. Because um, sometimes things, you know, if you think now of, uh, you know, the, the push on doing more uh, uh, equality and DEI focus equity issues in public policy, you know, that's a new layer of complexity to the analysis that, frankly, the, you know, the public didn't demand before. And we were, we were remiss for many years for not addressing. Um, a more crass example would be, you know, if you look at nuclear waste, uh, in the past, you know, dumping nuclear liquid nuclear waste out at Hanford wasn't necessarily a problem because you just dumped it into the ground. And then, you know, <laughs> at some point they realized that wasn't acceptable anymore. And then you had a bigger problem to handle. Okay, next slide, please. So that's the challenge then for the auditor is that where there's complexity, identifying cause gets very, very difficult, right? Uh, because the more complicated the system, when something's amiss, the trains are going off the tracks, figuring out why uh, it gets much more difficult to do document. And since I was a philosophy major, I had to pull in my favorite quote from uh, Spinoza, which is anything that's difficult, uh, it, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to tackle, but it's worth it in the end, right? All things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. The next slide, please. So this leads to this difficulty in identifying cause and getting behind this complexity it really leads to the use of more sophisticated and comprehensive criteria and methodologies and the need for uh, more and better data. Because um, you really you have to identify cause if you're going to be able to make uh, meaningful recommendations and to impact uh, the world and make changes, right? Um, 
you know, for the auditors, the, the mantra of an auditor for a finding, the elements of a finding, you know, it's condition, criteria, cause, and effect. What is, what should be, why is there delta, and what's, what's the bad effect of, of that delta, right? So you have to figure out what that causes, and, and, and you need the criteria, and the criteria is really driven by your, the lens by which you're looking at, and, that leads, and that's your sort of model and methodological approach. Next slide, please. So what does that lead to? That leads to, you know, what you see over time is a, a growing uh, body of work within GAO that embraces more complex methodologies and approaches. And so in the 80s and 90s, you have this, uh, the growth of the use of best practices as a way of looking at the operation of programs, particularly DOD programs. Um, and then you also have the emergence of the, uh, the guides, which both serve as an evaluative tool, but also are much more proactive to be used by managers, those in the executive carrying out these programs in order to better achieve uh, programmatic results. Um, the guides, you know, the, well, the best practices covered everything. I mean, that's from, you know, systems logistics to, you know, or changing organizational cultures to integrated portfolio management. It's a very large body of powerful uh, work was done uh, using those methodologies. And similarly, the guides, uh, you know, the geo schedule guide and the uh, cost estimating and assessment guides were really uh, important pieces of work that uh, have led to significant findings and improvement in government programs by sort of stepping back and trying to embrace and get our handle on this complexity. Next slide, please. So the other tool that we've, you know, I've been using more recently and uh, I think is very valuable, and we've had a reference to the uh, artificial intelligence uh, accountability framework is uh, more GAO framework reports. Um, so we had uh, a couple of years ago, the disaster resilience framework, which is a guide for federal actions to, you know, to promote resilience and climate related and other for uh, climate related uh, disasters. And then the report uh, I helped to work on a couple of years ago, dealing on risk informed decision making framework uh, for environmental issues. This was largely driven out of work looking at DOE's management of nuclear uh, waste. Um, and both of the frameworks really are sort of, again, it's a lens, it's a high level lens to, to frame and view complex problems and offer a constructive path for managers to address them. Um, you know, again, the common theme here is huge problems, uh, you know, high cost, lots of actors at all different levels of government. Um, and that's, that's sort of what drives and that's the, where this utility comes in. Could you uh, go to the next slide, please? So, for example, the risk-informed decision-making framework, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an overlay, right? It's not in, it doesn't replace the, the nuts and bolts requirements of, uh, you know, the environmental law, CERCLA, and RICRA. Um, it's broad enough to be applied to multiple types and scales of cleanup decision-making. And the framework is really meant to knit together all of the elements that, you know, as we used to focus on, you know, just like the, the smaller... Well, did you look at alternatives? What was your cost estimate? What was your schedule? You know, it knits all of that into a, co a cohesive whole. And when done well, the goal of this, the, having a good framework is really to, to establish a process that the uh, public will trust and understand the decision-making process so that even though they may not necessarily like what the final answer is, they have, the process has credibility and, and uh, support. Um, next slide, please. So all of these approaches, as you increase this complexity and the breadth and you're stepping back and trying to uh, take in more of the battlefield in, in terms of your review, all of those d d increase the demand for good data as well as an and the opportunity you to make better use of analytics. Um, And I think you, you'll see that, and I think you'll see that especially on the programmatic side as folks try to execute these programs. You need to, you need to pull that, that data and the, the analytic approach. So the caution I would have here uh, before I wrap up is just that it's the, there's a temptation always to fall in love with data and your, and your analytics. And the caution I have is just the, 
they're not the answer in and of themselves, right? The data, the data analysis, the data you get and the analysis you, you, you generate, uh, if it's mysterious, if it looks like a black box, it's not gonna garner support. So there still needs to be a framework within which that data and analysis operates and is communicated for the results to be supported and viewed as legitimate. And I think that's really some of like the risk-informed decision-making framework really comes into uh, to play here, which is you have to have those elements. Those elements are essential for it to succeed, but the rest of it has to be there in terms of collaboration, outreach, transparency for the process to have uh, standing and, and lasting effect. Um, and with that, I will feed the floor and look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Okay, this, uh, this is David again. Um, our next speaker is Matt Auer. He's a professor and dean of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. Um, <clears throat> he previously held positions as vice president for academic affairs and dean of the faculty, pro uh, professor of environmental studies at Bates College, and was also dean of the Hon Honors College at Indiana University. His research focuses on the politics of decision-making in the arenas of environmental protection, energy policy, and forest policy. And he's published extensively in journals such as Policy Science and the International Journal, journal of Climate Change Strategies and Management. He's a recipient of many teaching and research awards. Uh, he holds a, an MS and PhD from Yale University. He has a um, he has a degree in forest and environmental studies from Tufts University and an AB from Harvard University. Matt, over to you. Thank you so much, David. Um, I really appreciate being part of the proceedings here and have enjoyed the talk so far. And it, it occurs to me that many of the concepts that Chris and Tak and David have discussed could be now applied to uh, what I'll call sort of an in-depth case as we think about the issue of wildfire. And so I'll try to use some of the concepts that we're working with here with complexity, add in urgency and equity and stick to our um, interest in data and information technology and try to bring those together. But I do hope that folks will be able to have uh, some of the concepts and some of the tools that have been mentioned uh, so far and think about them in the context of the slides that I'm about to share with you. So I'm adding in urgency and equity. I think talk actually has also um, alluded to equity and socioeconomic variables in his presentation. In the context of wildfire and what we're talking about here are just, is destructive wildfire in the US. The problem is urgent. Uh, if you pick up the newspaper or um, listen to the radio or watch the news, hardly a day goes by during the fire season, so to speak. And the fire season now almost seems like it's 365 days a year. Uh, but the issue of destructive wildfire and the impact on ecosystems, on people's lives, on property, on public health has been getting worse. And so this trend line shows you that um, only over uh, the past few years has it been the case that as many as 10 million or more acres of land has been destroyed by wildfire and all that's since 1960, as we measure this, uh, the instances when that's happened have just been the last few years. Right now we're on pace in 2021, we have something close to about 6 million acres that have been destroyed by, by erratic wildfire. Uh, we'll see if it gets to 10. I hope it doesn't, but it's been another bad fire season. And this is data that was partway into the summer to suggest that 2021 isn't really much better than 2020, and 2020 was a bad year too. Um, we have many more wildfires uh, to 
to deal with this year than we did last year. They aren't necessarily as big, although there are some huge wildfires uh, that we're still battling in California and Oregon. Now the issue of complexity to think about, um, and, in, and what I'm getting at here now uh, is really at the landscape scale, so to speak, the complexity that creates a wicked problem in the form of an individual fire or set of fires that now drives the larger problem of how we come up with the right way to think about the risks from wildfire and address those risks as a wicked problem. We have to really turn back the clock to see some of the origins of the causal factors include a strategy that was developed by the first director of the Forest Service, Gifford Pencho, who was not of the mind that um, wildfire uh, could be used in a constructive way to manage forests, particularly fire adapted forests. The idea that emerged pretty quickly after some very bad and deadly uh, erratic wildfires in the Mountain West in the 1920s and 30s was, well, let's extinguish those fires as quickly as possible. And the 10 a.m. strategy basically dictated that if you detect a wildfire, it needs to be extinguished by 10 a.m. the next morning. And that policy really remains in place until around 1970. What that does is it leads to the buildup of forest fuels on the ground. Now, when you add in climate change and the various factors here, and folks, I want you to think about Chris Kaliba's uh, presentation when he talked about things like complex system modeling. You have, uh, for example, hotter summers, warmer winter temperatures. Uh, if you don't get a deep freeze, then maybe that's enabling pat forest pet pathogens and pests to uh, have longer, uh, greater opportunities to propagate more tree death and more buildup of forest fuels. So magnifying the, the problem of uh, the buildup of those fuels. Uh, the hot summers themselves can lead to more tree death because photosynthesis is is shutting down, trees are dying. And then, as you probably well know, in the Southwest, and in particular, the Pacific coastal states are experiencing uh, what would otherwise be cyclical drought is becoming intensified by climate change. So those hot summer temperatures, warmer winters, the intensification of that drought, yet more tree death, all of those issues then are drivers, but for any particular uh, wildfire incident, uh, maybe only some of these variables matter. Then you've got the issue of lightning strikes. It's not clear to what extent climate change and lightning strikes are directly connected to one another. Is there a positive correlation? Well, to the extent that maybe there are more uh, electrical storms that are generated in the context of warmer summer temperatures, and moisture in the air, then perhaps there is a correlation, but the jury is still out. But in any case, there's no question that lightning strikes are a major contributor to destructive wildfire. And so that pattern, then that relationship between, let's say, tree death, build up of forest fuels, and the ignition source coming directly from lightning strikes is, is an issue. But so are human ignition sources. So consider, for example, the campfire a hugely uh, catastrophic fire from just a few years ago uh, in California that destroyed Paradise, California. That was largely driven, the proximate source of that is a human ignition source, which is faulty and completely amortized equipment owned by Pacific Gas and Electric. And as you may recall, Pacific Gas and Electric ultimately pled guilty to something like 86 or seven counts of involuntary manslaughter. And as part of their uh, bankruptcy set up a uh, fund amounting to tens of billions of dollars to deal with claims from tens of thousands of people whose homes were destroyed. But here's a case where it's a human ignition source. Then more recently, you may recall uh, this past summer, uh, the heat dome that formed over the Pacific Northwest stretching into Canada, Canada and British Columbia. The town of Lytton, 
British Columbia was completely erased from the map. Um, and we, at this time, are not entirely sure what the proximate source of uh, the ignition is in this case. Could it have been a spark from a train track? Right now, there are people, uh, there are communities that are suing uh, Canadian Pacific and Canadian National uh, Railways, uh, pointing the blame at them. But this combination then of the human ignition source and the other conditions, when we drill down to a sample size of one, which is what we need to think about uh, when it comes to addressing a particular wildfire, uh, really matters a great deal. And that only becomes more complex still when we think about, again, that landscape's scale. Uh, issues like what's the slope of the terrain? What kind of vegetation type are we dealing with? Do we have a condition where there are spot fires that might merge with the main fire? Is there a steady wind for us to think about? What direction is the wind? What about gusts of wind? Are those gusts running perpendicular to the ridge line, uh, which can definitely magnify or magnify a wildfire? What effect will all this have on efforts to treat the fire and address it? Uh, for example, uh, using fire retardant that's uh, being dropped by uh, vessels, airborne vessels, uh, jets, embers that might uh, be airborne embers that may be a, a mile or more ahead of the main fire. Uh, what do we do about trying to predict where those land and to, to what extent are built structures uh, uh, have the features in place to uh, mitigate the risks from those embers? Uh, was the weather properly forecast? And as everybody knows, the further out we forecast, in some cases, one or two days, uh, the bands of uncertainty are, are that much bigger for us to uh, address. In the case of the bootleg fire in Oregon, we had the formation of pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which create all kinds of remarkable and complex uncertainties when it comes to uh, addressing the fire on the ground, uh, including the, prob the probability of more lightning strikes, trying to understand the bands of precipitation and how that's gonna change the direction of the fire, et cetera. So these very local and contextual factors add some uh, complexities to the way that people on the ground are gonna respond. The equity issues that uh, I shared with uh, David and, uh, and others when we shared some read ahead materials uh, have to do with the simple fact that there are more people in the way of destructive wildfire than ever before. And that's care of some of these complex factors like climate change and drought. And so with that, we need to think about the capability or the capacity of people to actually make uh, the intervention, interventions that they need to make in order to harden their homes, make their homes and the landscape around their homes fireproof. So some of the work that we're doing has to do with these equity issues. We're trying to get a handle on some of the data with respect to if a homeowner is in the way of destructive wildfire and they are in a region where the median household income maybe is less than say somebody in Malibu, who has a second home or in the Bay Area, uh, we need to really think about this in terms of equity issues and, and among other things, recognize that increasingly we have more homeowners policies being not renewed or being canceled. So there's the cost of trying to find that replacement household insurance, home insurance, combined with the expectation that the insurer is, gonna, is going to require you to make some mitigation measures. And those are costly. Well, if I'm in a place like, let's say, Montana, Texas, Oklahoma, which we haven't really spent as much time talking about when it comes to wildfire risk as we have places like California, Oregon, Washington, increasingly Idaho, we need to really think about that. So the equity issues matter uh, in ways that add to the issues of complexity, but take us away from some of the typical things that we think about as auditors when we focus on 
efficacy or efficiency, we also need to think about equity. So in the article I sent, I talk about um, programs that are in place that really require um, multiple actors to enable uh, households and folks that don't have the resources on their own to make these mitigation measures to harden their homes. And in this case, this image is trying to intentionally take some of the complexity out of the conundrum of how do we deal with complexity by providing people on the ground just enough information that they can act on it. So if somebody were to say to me, hey, I'm a homeowner or I'm in a neighborhood where I wanna take advantage of the Idaho Firewise grants, who tends to be involved in putting together those grants, managing them, cooperating, collaborating with one another to literally help me in my neighborhood? This image is trying to give a sense of the grant activity that's taken place over the past few years and the types of collaborations that are in place. This would be in contrast to what is otherwise, I think, a terrific um, approach that we have. And I'm really thinking about what David Trimble just said about data and how seductive it can be. We do have the power, for example, with network analysis to make very nuanced and granular and complex maps of the way that organizations, actors, interest groups engage with one another. But for someone on the ground, the question is, how do I make sense of this? In this case, and I don't think it's the intention of these particular authors, I probably would be reducing out some of those network connections and links and nodes to give uh, something that's going to be a bit more um, user friendly for those actors on the ground, those policy actors and those end users who are making an intervention. Uh, yes, we can map all that complexity, but it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily need all that data. So the closing thoughts that I have uh, get the, these questions of how much do we need to know in order to be effective both on the diagnostic end of things with understanding risk pathways and estimating risks, but also with regard to the prescriptions and that it has to do with then developing, applying and evaluating, including auditing, doing the policy appraisal work GAO does with institutional responses. When issues are urgent, like let's say wildfire, I think we do have to be sensitive to this notion of diminishing returns to scale. So there may be particular tools that we use, particular technologies that are very powerful, but in an urgent situation, we need to ask, do we need to be perfectly accurate and precise, or do we move forward with, with what we have, particularly knowing that we need to translate this for end users on the ground. This is just a little caveat, but what I show you in these two images here at the top image is a, is a if you will, an old fashioned uh, fire lookout. This is a gentleman who is in a fire tower in one of the national uh, forests. His job is literally to use a pair of binoculars and that little circular map, which was actually invented uh, shortly after the, uh, the disaster of the Titanic to try to pinpoint an emergency. He also has a two-way radio. He happens to be a writer, so he has an Olivetti typewriter there. These are old fashioned technologies and they could be replaced by much more sophisticated technologies. And in fact, in some cases they are, these fire lookouts, these fire spotters. In the second image, you see an unmanned solar drone, uh, which is a remarkable uh, breakthrough for the purpose of spotting wildfire. And in fact, it's probably a little more accurate than an otherwise skillful human fire spotter up in a fire tower. However, the drone costs about $160,000 a pop. So there are some issues there to think about in terms of costs, adoption of technology, et cetera. Um, so for us, we do need to think about, um, are we balancing urgency with accuracy and precision? Uh, there's 
uh, no argument with, with the value of, of being accurate and precise. For example, with trying to identify a wildfire before it gets out of control, making sure that our prescriptions are translatable, translatable to people on the ground. And then this issue of, of equity, and those are the topics I'm, I'm trying to get at here in this presentation. You know, David just uh, provided um, a perspective from his favorite philosopher, Spinoza. I'm not going to suggest that Donald Rumsfeld is my favorite philosopher, but in developing uh, these remarks, I recall his own comment somewhat defensively when he said that you go to war with the army that you have and not the army that you might want. And it's just something we need to think about in the context of urgent problems. And uh, we need to think about that when we're auditing and appraising policy responses and aggregating all of those individual fires and the responses to them to make sure that we're capturing each one of these um, very granular, uh, somewhat idiosyncratic dimensions of the, of the specific context of these fires. So thank you. I wanted to mention one thing before we move to the next speaker. Um, to the audience, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to start um, sending them along to us and we will process them and try to get to them during the discussion time. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Chris Curry. Uh, he's a director in the US Government Accountability Office Homeland Security and Justice Team. He is responsible for leading GAO's work on disaster preparedness, response and recovery, as well as DHS management related issues. Chris has been a GA GAO since 2002 and has led numer numerous reviews of Homeland Security issues. He holds an MA in public administration from Georgia State University and a BA in history from the University of Georgia. Chris. Uh, thank you, David. And like everyone else has said, it's just an honor to be here uh, with so many smart people talking about interesting things. It was really interesting to hear uh, Professor Auer's presentation on wildfires. That's an issue we focus on a, a lot now and uh, great to follow a fellow bulldog. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today. We can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the areas that we work in in the homeland security area and specifically uh, these all fall under the national preparedness umbrella I would call it uh, we're preparing for anything uh, but I'm going to talk about biodefense national preparedness and then disaster recovery and it's interesting because first of all I absolutely love working in this area it's so fascinating and, and homeland security is so fascinating um, and, and what I'd like to do today is just dive into some of these areas, but also um, provide some specific examples of the complexity that we're talking about today. And then more so talk a little bit about why the solutions are, are even more challenging than identifying the problems themselves. And we've been thinking about this a lot over the last few years, and I can't really take credit. I, you know, I, I get to work with some incredibly smart, thoughtful people at GAO. And for a while now, doing work in this area, we, keep, we kept saying, you know, all of these issues are really big, they're complicated, they're expensive, they're fragmented, and then they also occur at every level of government. Um, so, you know, at every level, it's just, it's difficult and, and it's complicated. And also another common theme was that there's expectations, you know, out in the private sector and from our citizens and state and local governments that the federal government is going to do more and more and more to address these issues because increasingly it's beyond the capacity of anyone but the federal government uh, to address. So these are things we've been we've been noticing for some time in this area and uh, you know this presentation and the topic I think solidified it for me as I was uh, putting it together. So if we could go to the next slide I'll talk about biodefense. So first of all, and this is going to hit home to people right now because uh, of the pandemic, but we've been focused on this for, you know, the better part of 15 years and worried about uh, how challenging of an issue this is to address because of exactly what we just saw with the pandemic. But for years, we've been talking about 
that this is both complicated and fragmented. Um, it occurs across federal departments. No one department really had responsibility for biodefense or pandemic planning and things like that. Um, also, there was a vacuum of, of information and relationships between the feds and state, local, and tribal governments as well. And of course, as we saw in the pandemic, there was some breakdowns in, in cooperation and coordination between government and, and the private sector, in this case, the healthcare industry. And of course, we have the international coordination and collaboration piece of this too. But you know, one of the things this shows, and you're going to see a common theme in these areas, is that these issues are no longer up to any one department to be responsible for and to address. And it makes the solutions very, very challenging. In this biodefense arena, um, you have numerous federal agencies, as the graphic shows, involved. Um, they all do different things. They all have different responsibilities. Um, and the solutions are, are tough. Um, and we've noticed that over the years, we've been advocating for uh, a strong strategic approach and strategy at the federal level to guide these efforts. Um, I think everybody got that when we said it, um, but it's very, very difficult to actually achieve because departments don't necessarily have to work together. They don't share resources well. And um, also, frankly, it cuts across different congressional committees of jurisdiction too. So you know, legislatively, it's really hard to change the, the status quo or the way systems work uh, because it crosses so many different uh, departments and areas. Uh, next slide, please. So some of our findings in this area are what I talked about, you know, that need and what we're starting to see in these cross-departmental big difficult areas is that, you know, no one agency can address these issues. So when we're making recommendations, you know, we have to think through these issues of, we can't just tell the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Health and Human Services to take an action without thinking about how they're gonna work together in the broader context of, of the overall federal approach to this. So many of our recommendations and policy findings are, are very cross-departmental and cross-governmental, which, um, you know, is the right thing to do, but it makes implementation very difficult. And I think actually agencies often get kind of frustrated with those types of recommendations because they're not easy to address, but uh, they take a long time to implement. But um, it's, it's what we're seeing is that the, there's no easy, the problems aren't easy and there's no easy solutions either. Next slide, please. So in, in the realm of national preparedness, it's, it's another area. So shortly after Hurricane Katrina, you know, that was kind of the wake up call that um, we didn't have an overall federal approach that was coordinated with all levels of government or how we were going to tackle catastrophic events. And because of that, a number of huge gaps were exposed. So since that time, the federal government has built uh, sort of a, a, a preparedness apparatus and developed doctrine around that and how coordination is supposed to work. But again, it's a very difficult challenge to address because you have, you know, 14 different federal departments involved in some way. Um, they all have to coordinate with state and local governments. Um, it's very hard to assess uh, the capabilities across all those areas. And it's even harder once you do assess those to actually prioritize resources to address them. Because again, you can, different levels of government can't tell each other what to do. Different departments can't tell each other what to do. So a number of our recommendations in this area have, have been to develop those coordinating mechanisms have, have actually been directed towards uh, coordinating bodies that can work across departments to implement these recommendations. But again, very hard to implement, often take a long period of time because they require extensive coordination at the federal level. And also very difficult to get action without uh, something really bad happening uh, to begin with. And I think the pandemic is a perfect example of that. Unfortunately, a number of the gaps that were identified you know, in the pandemic uh, were things that had long been identified in prior uh, exercises and after action reports from prior events. It's just very difficult, if not impossible, to address them or provide the resources to address them until something really bad happens. Next slide, please. Disaster recovery is, is, is just another area we've seen. 
increasingly over the last 15 years, uh, more and more federal agencies are providing funding and assistance to citizens, to state and local governments, to tribes. Uh, on the, as the slide says, since 2005, the federal government's provided about half a trillion dollars in disaster assistance. This comes from 15 different federal agencies. None of these programs were ever designed to really work in concert together uh, in a coordinated way. And so it's a very fragmented approach. And you can imagine uh, if you're a state and local community, um, you know, you're getting all these, this money or the, these opportunities to get money from different federal agencies. And, and in your view, it's all the federal government, but they all have different rules, different requirements, different timeframes. Um, and it makes it very, very difficult to coordinate community recovery and even harder to assess the effectiveness of that recovery as well. So again, something we've been grappling with in this area is what do we do about this? Um, you know, do we make recommendations to specific departments? We do sometimes if something can be fixed within a certain program, but increasingly we're making recommendations to certain programs, but we're also making recommendations across departments to work together to address these challenging issues. And I think the uh, discussion about equity is a great and timely one um, that Professor R talked about. Uh, this is something we're dealing with in, in the disaster area too, is you know, how, how are these programs being administered through the lens of equity uh, to help the communities that need it most? Um, and you could do that on a programmatic level and that's difficult enough, but you know, how do you do it across these suite of programs that involves multiple departments and multiple programs that all work very differently? It's, it's a huge challenge and something that we're gonna be grappling with uh, more and more. So I think, you know, somebody was talking about 21st century uh, policy challenges. I think that this is going to be increasingly the thing that defines uh, our work for a long period of time is trying to address these huge cross-cutting issues. And then once we develop uh, the potential solutions that, you know, it's going to have to be very active and thoughtful monitoring of that over time to see if they're effective because they're going to take a long time to implement because there's no quick and easy solutions to these kinds of issues. So that's my presentation. I look forward to uh, the Q&A later in the discussion. Thank you, Chris, very much. Very interesting presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Brian Gerber. Uh, Brian, Brian Gerber is an associate professor in the College of Public Service and Community Solutions, Arizona State University. He's the academic director of the Master of Arts in Emergency Management and Homeland Security, and is co-director of the ASU Center for Emergency Management and Homeland Security. <clears throat> His research interests uh, include work on disaster policy and management, homeland security policy, and environmental regulation. He's led emergency exercises and has participated in uh, catastrophic incident planning projects and co conducted program evaluations and policy analyses on disasters and pandemic preparedness. <clears throat> he has served as a principal investigator um, and researcher on grants from the federal, state, and local level institutions such as the National Science Foundation, U.S. Departments of Education and Navy, HUD, the Louisiana Devar Department of Health and Hospitals, and the Col Colorado Department of Public Safety. With that, I'll pass it over to Brian. Great, thank you, David. Um, thanks for organizing this panel. Thanks uh, for the invitation today to all the folks at GAO. Uh, very appreciative of that. And, and I was going to echo David Trimble and say it's a real honor to be with this August group, but then I looked at the calendar and, and saw it was September. So then I got confused and didn't know what he was talking about. So um, given you're on mute, I'm going to assume that there were no groans there and that everybody appreciated that joke. OK, moving on. So I want to talk a little bit um, uh, about disaster risk reduction, community resilience, capacity building. Um, and really, this, this is a, a compliment to Chris Curry's uh, presentation, which was excellent. And hopefully I'll, I'll fill out um, uh, some of the points that, that Chris just made uh, with, a, with a slightly different perspective. So uh, next slide, please. 
and I'll and I'll briefly in, in the in the short amount of time we have, I'll briefly um, uh, try to touch on these three questions. What are the core challenges in disaster risk reduction and community resilience capacity building? Are these intractable challenges or are they surmountable? Um, and how might auditing and evaluation practices contribute to uh, practice improvement in the, in the risk reduction and resilience capacity building areas? So next slide. So just for context, I don't think I need to uh, spend much time on this. Uh, I think we're all aware of, of what uh, 21st century hazard and disaster uh, trends look like. Uh, but just in case, if, if, if you haven't spent any time looking at the most recent IPCC uh, report, assessment report, the sixth assessment report, um, it's fairly, uh, fairly stark, uh, uh, alarming, I think is, is, a, is a useful word. Um, we're looking at uh, issues ranging from uh, sea level rise that's going to um, uh, jeopardize small island nations, probably uh, precipitate uh, withdrawal or retreat from coastal areas in many parts of the globe, uh, massive, massive population displacement uh, across the globe, um, uh, extreme weather, uh, intense, intensified extreme weather incidents. Uh, so obviously that's a, that's a bleak uh, portrait, but if you want to get even more depressed, um, uh, Swiss RE, which is one of the big global uh, reinsurance firms, uh, they put out an index, um, uh, the most recent one, I think it's the most recent one from last year, uh, uh, noted that because of, of uh, harms to biodiversity and, and systems that support biodiversity, um, fully one-fifth of the globe is looking at uh, uh, full-scale ecosystem collapse uh, this century. Um, so that's a, a very difficult uh, challenge. Um, and putting it in, in, in research terms, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, my friend and colleague, my co-director at the, the Center for Emergency Management here at ASU, uh, Melanie Gall. Um, about a decade ago, she and some of her colleagues uh, wrote an excellent, uh, excellent paper on uh, hazard loss trends being unsustainable. Uh, um, she updated that recently uh, last year with another paper. Um, but uh, clearly, I just mentioned this because there's there's literally um, uh, um, no way to to characterize uh, hazards and hazard risk uh, in the U.S. and globally as anything other than um, uh, the most complex and serious kind of policy challenge that we can confront. Um, I just noted another paper that, I, you know, it's not widely cited, uh, but it's really a useful paper um, by some uh, researchers, I think primarily from the Netherlands um, in a journal um, called Earth's Future, uh, which is a paper from 2019 that uh, looks at consecutive disasters or interdependent risk. It's a good, uh, good illustration of, of how we have to um, really take seriously the, the notion of interdependent risk. And that is implications, not only from a, from a policy making standpoint, but also from uh, an agency like GAO and, and the work that uh, you all do. So next slide. Sorry, I was trying to click my slides myself. Next slide, please. Um, so I would define uh, challenges in the hazard or disaster risk reduction and resilience capacity building area as, as falling under three, you know, I'm sure you can create your own list, but for me, I would say three primary, primary challenges. One is policy design itself. Um, I won't spend uh, uh, a lot of time uh, talking about this because I think this is probably familiar to everyone in this, in this audience, but we're talking about siloed policy domains. Chris, uh, Chris Curry was just referencing that, uh, narrowly defined administrative systems and authorities. Um, what I think if, if you uh, do any work at the state or local level, which is really where operationally uh, hazard mitigation, hazard risk reduction work uh, really happens and, and should uh, occupy more attention, I think, from a, from a research and evaluation standpoint, um, uh, the, the nature of uh, narrowly defined funding streams, uh, the shared funding between uh, federal, state, and local government, there's, there's a historic bias toward physical capital investment versus, uh, versus human capital investment, uh, short time horizons for funded projects. All of these things um, work against 
uh, effective long-term uh, risk reduction or resilience promotion. Um, then we, we, we turn to the issue of problem definition itself. Historically, disaster science research um, is sort of organized around discrete hazards. So you have people that are, have expert, expertise in seismology or hydrology, et cetera, and you look, talk about flood risk or earthquake risk and, and those sorts of issues. Um, uh, uh, that is obviously important and useful, but it also uh, uh, limits our ability to understand a broad integrated perspective that, that Chris Curry was just driving at. And I think even in the area of resilience, resilience is one of those funny terms because uh, academics talk about resilience. It's become part of the nomenclature in the disaster management world, including at, at the federal level. But uh, I can tell you from having spent the last 15, 20 years working with especially state and local government, uh, when you talk to people with operational responsibilities, there's a wide uh, variety of, of uh, understanding what resilience might mean. And, and typically, and I don't think I'm wrong about this, typically, uh, if you look at what people typically mean, most frequently mean by resilience, they're gonna, or if you ask them, a uh, practitioner, they're going to talk about uh, standard risk reduction or, or mitigation practices, uh, which is, I think, not the same thing. They're not quite equivalent. Um, and so I think one for me, my own perspective is we really have to think about um, uh, public goods production processes, think about disaster risk reduction as a um, and, and resilience capacity is similar to national defense, which is an amalgamated, uh, often intangible or non-tangible, not hard asset goods. So um, that leads us to the issue of hazards governance uh, um, um, and the need to understand better uh, public resource investments, regulatory stringency, how those dynamics work, governance around hazards as a focal point. So next slide, please. I'm just gonna quickly go over the last couple. Um, are these problems really wicked or merely surly? Uh, um, I was gonna call them potentially irascible problems, but uh, that's too hard to spell. But I think we've seen, um, uh, there's a lot of cause for optimism. Um, and so I'm not sure wicked is the right way to think about this because we do see lots of at the federal, state and local level uh, transboundary or integrated mechanisms like watershed management models, uh, coastal, uh, coastal hazards management master plans. Um, if we have time during q and I can tell you a little bit about an illustration of Healthy Homes, the Healthy Homes program in, in Iowa, which is a good model. Um, we have uh, and Chris, was, Chris Curry was just driving at this. We have examples of jointly funded or mission funded initiatives um, that, that we could talk about during Q&A if, if people want, but really the, the challenge is to have these uh, cross agency, cross sector and multi-agency funding mechanisms that span broader time horizons and, and how that uh, can function in practice. If we get a chance to talk during q and I can uh, elaborate on that. So last slide. Um, um, what this all means for GAO and, and um, um, auditing and evaluation, I think, again, uh, has been outlined in various uh, previous talks. I think uh, process compliance is obviously a, a central issue, um, auditing along process compliance, but we really have to move more toward a, a, a auditing and, and assessment based on a systems integration focus if we're going to really understand how communities build resilience uh, capacity more effectively. Um, and that also includes uh, rethinking what are standard performance metrics in this domain. Uh, but again, um, I think I'm out of time. So I will uh, uh, stop right there. Um, and hopefully we can have a few uh, discussion questions on, on some of those topics. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. And now I wanted to turn it back to Chris Kaliba uh, for some summing up comments, and then he'll move us into discussion. Great, uh, thank you, David. And, and thanks to the panelists for uh, a real enlightening, engaging, and, and really coherent and integrated set of talks. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna go through a couple, you know, who, what, when, where, why kind of questions that I, from a thematic standpoint, beginning with the whys. Why, why even this panel? Why, why complexity? Um, and I think it was uh, 
was David that Tremble that mentioned the idea of contextual sophistication um, and our ever-growing need to better understand that uh, contextual framework framing uh, of how uh, context drives our wicked problems like wildfires and biodefense needs um, and what have you. Um, another big why uh, I think in this space and why we need to think about complexity and I would argue um, advancing more uh, computational methodologies to study that contextual sophistication um, that was raised by our last three speakers, which was the governance and coordination fragmentation problem, um, fragmentation or silos, um, and how best to overcome those, uh, and whether and what's persuasive uh, from a systems view um, to support better systems integration, as Brian just mentioned, uh, and how can we get government across all scales of governance um, to become more integrated um, in addressing these problems. And, and in addition, uh, another why is this need for coupled systems analysis. Uh, the examples of, of, of biohazards and, and wildfires, for example, we need uh, the social science community and the policy experts engaged with the, the, the hydrologists and the, um, and the forest management. Uh, uh, fields and what have you. So there's a there's a need to understand that systems integration through a transdisciplinary lens. Um, and then what's the what in this? Um, and what ultimately comes down to being an empiricist, I think first, and a theorist theoretician second in my own work is is data. Is uh, what kind of data do we have available? And so Taka um, and his innovation lab team are really at the vanguard for. For, for GAO here of, of taking very complex data sets and, and making sense of them. And uh, I believe it was back in the Obama administration, there was the open government uh, uh, initiative and the digitization of, of government data sets. And um, from a modeling perspective, uh, our models are only as good as the data we have available. And so um, a question to, to put out there, uh, and I'll come back to this, but, but just thinking about data availability um, to be able to, uh, to better understand this contextual sophistication. Um, and, and another what has to do with the parameter space and what we set around those parameters. And again, Brian was speaking about our performance indicators and that changing dynamic. Um, several folks, uh, uh, particularly Matt, uh, really focused in on the equity question. And how do we begin to fold these new goals or these emerging goals? Equity is not a new goal, but... A, but an emerging goal and prioritization um, in this, and, and then better understand the urgency around it. So uh, how do we become more time uh, sensitive? Uh, how do we develop more early warning systems uh, to be able to be timely and, and responsive uh, and ultimately save lives and, and reduce reduced hazards? Um, and then who? who? Who's involved in this enterprise? And I think this also, uh, begs this question of, around communication, right? So the GIO generates reports and it sends it to Congress. Um, Congress filters that back to the agencies, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure GAO also shares the reports to the agencies. Um, but we need to be thinking a sophisticated, more in a sophisticated sense around end users. Um, thinking again of Taka's models um, is, is how is it, how do, who's using these outputs and how can we expand the domains of who uses these uh, beyond the, the narrower band? And this may be one way we can overcome uh, governance silo, silos and fragmentation by really thinking about end use and data uses and data visualizations and the cultivation of audience um, and how data can actually be used to help cultivate new audiences and get people's attention. Um, the other piece of who goes back to this transdisciplinarity, that the idea around team science and, and really the harnessing teams of experts around, better, again, better understanding of contextual sophistication. Um, and then again, another who is the multi-level governance question, uh, the polycentric governance question that um, I think has been dominating my field of public administrations and, and, and Matt's field uh, for, for, I would say going on two, two and a half decades um, which is how do we overcome that governance fragmentation? How do we better um, design governance arrangements um, to, uh, to better uh, serve our needs? And lastly, this how question, and this gets back to the question that I kind of posed or the framing that I originally 
posed at the beginning, which is um, how do we incorporate and use, utilize new methodologies for studying these wicked problems um, to our benefit? Um, and you know, I've, I've really evolved my own work in this space to thinking like a modeler. Um, and David Tremble mentioned um, the frameworks, the risk assessment framework. Um, you know, researchers really appreciate those frameworks, those system frameworks, as we structure model dynamics. And so those stock and flow uh, uh, cord, uh, visuals that some of you may be coming up with, um, we're, we're paying attention and what we're trying to do is operationalize those. Um, and then incorporate emerging goals like equity, um, like resiliency. Um, and I guess the last thing I just to observe is, is and this is a, a question then I throw to the rest of the panel, you know, there's that metaphor that you, you know, we've lost our car keys in the dark and um, we start searching for those car keys under the lamplight. Um, and, and, and this metaphor, that lamplight is our methods, our standard methods for inquiry and, and, and response uh, and, and analysis. Um, how, do we, how do we expand uh, that purview? And is the data science uh, and AI, is this a, a vehicle for, uh, for helping us to expand our space, our strategy space to better understand? And so uh, I, I believe, David, you want me to kick off a question to the panel. Um, and, and I think this is a kind of a, a provoking one is what scenarios would uh, the panelists like to see play out um, and better understood, but we're afraid to necessarily even sketch it out and analyze because we felt constrained by our methods um, or by the, the availability of data. Um, what questions uh, and, and possible scenarios are on our wish list uh, to address the, the, the problems in our space? Um, and to what extent, uh, you know, I think collectively we can begin to think about how do we actually envision ways of running those scenarios in, in some sort of simulated space or some sort of a, a machine learning uh, approach, if, if possible, um, to address some of the, the, the pressing problems and, and, and lack of or challenging solutions, as so many of our panelists said, uh, mentioned. So, you know, again, are you feeling constrained in your in your in your expertise domain by by our methods, or are we feeling pretty good about uh, where we're going with this, or, or to what extent are we uh, interested in, uh, in addressing some of these questions through um, some new uh, machine learning or data science or simulation approaches? So I guess that's my, my opening question. Um, and then, David, I'll let you also uh, manage, manage this flow. And I have a few more, but, but I also see a bunch of questions that are coming through the chat. Sounds good. Thank, thank you very much for that, Chris. Why don't we just... Uh see if uh, the panel have any responses to Chris's question. Um, why don't you just unmute yourselves and uh, go ahead if you have uh, some ideas. Yeah, um, this is uh, David. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's sort of like a, uh, asking for a Christmas wish list, right? <laughs> There's lots of solutions I would love to have. I, the one that comes up, uh, you know, has come up in the past is, you know, when we've looked at cleanup decisions, both in the uh, EPA space, but also in the DOE nuclear cleanup space is, you know, if you, if you are uh, omnipotent, you know, whatever, omniscient, and you could actually have the data to figure out sort of where's the best return on investment of say a hundred million dollars in cleanup budget, $50 million. Right. And if you, so you could prioritize the nation's cleanup activities based on return on investment, not necessarily that that should dictate what the solution is as much as it is to illustrate that the choices we are making that are at odds with that are being made for, to, to further other values. Like a lot, sometimes it's just like, uh, we didn't know we were doing that, but sometimes it's because they have to ma maximize other equities, like, you know, between states or certain communities or other legal commitments. But I think sometimes the value of that kind of analysis is also just as a way to sort of shed light on implicit trade-offs that the system and the process are making that we don't necessarily always acknowledge or um, 
talk about, but are, but are still legitimate and people need to recognize those. Um, this, the other Chris, Chris Curry, um, you know, it's interesting. I don't, um, in, in our area, I don't know that it's so much a lack of analysis or data. Um, I, I think more so maybe it would be if I could wish for anything, we could somehow change human nature about being proactive or preventive about things we know are bad or that are going to happen. Um, and I'll give you a great example. Um, so it's common in the emergency management world and the preparedness world to exercise all the time. I mean, if you go to any state, local, federal emergency management department, they're always exercising things and they do a phenomenal job exercising things. And these exercises spit out tons of data and gaps and lessons learned. And then everyone goes back and says, well, that was just a great exercise. All right, let's go back to the regular, our regular job. They don't do anything with the exercises. And we see this over and over again. There's these gaps that are identified don't get closed. And, and some of the reasons are one, nobody's responsible for sort of centrally following up. Nobody has the authority to tell anybody else what to do to follow up. They don't have the resources to follow up because, you know, think about if you're a county, you know, manager and you go to your county commission and said, we just found out we have this huge gap and it's going to cost us a million dollars to fix it if this happens in the future. And they say, well, that sounds great for the future, but that's the future. So I, I think that's the biggest challenge that I see in some of these issues is that it's not a lack of information or awareness that, that these things are there. They're going to happen. Brian. Yeah, if I could jump in. So I, I agree, you know, Chris uh, uh, Curry, uh, you know, I've been <laughs> in lots of those exercises and lots of uh, after action reviews and, and planning meetings. Um, and I agree with that completely, but I would say um, uh, two things. One, from an analytic standpoint, I, I, I think if you if you consider the fact that uh, for uh, whether a real world incident or or an exercised uh, scenario, um, we don't understand very well how. Um, discrete administrative systems interact. We don't understand very well how uh, government, private, and nonprofit sectors interact in terms of service delivery, both in, in response, long-term recovery. Um, uh, uh, we have almost no uh, comprehensive strategic, strategically integrated risk reduction uh, approaches. <laughs> Everything's siloed as, as I was trying to, to Chris Kaliba's question, I think, the, um, he touched his summary touched on some of the key issues like uh, better systems analysis. Um, simulation is a is a huge tool that I don't think that the, the the disaster science community has done well enough from a understanding how uh, governance practices, administrative systems work. Uh, because a lot of historically, a lot of the disaster science has been technically focused on on hazards rather than uh, governance aspects, which was I, what I was trying to drive at. Um, um, and I, I think I, I think the the broader solution has to be rethinking authorizing legislation, rethinking funding strategies, as, as I was alluding to, you know, FEMA's BRIC approach is, is a good step forward, um, um, but it, it needs to go much, much further. We have to change time horizons, management models um, that were referenced, some of them were referenced on a regional scale, regional uh, scale are just absolutely essential because you can't <laughs> separate out on arbitrary uh, say county jurisdictional boundaries and say we're going to have any effectiveness in dealing with something that's inherently transboundary, not at a national level, but at a uh, interstate level, but as a international level, but as within national systems. Um, so I think uh, I, I think um, it's it's both the um, improvement in in understanding uh, governance practices, but also um, uh, rethinking problem scale, jurisdictional responsibility in a different way, and, and really improving uh, funding and performance assessment. Matt, uh, I was just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to add anything or. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I keep coming back to this question of 
of equity and you know th thinking about this in the context of wildfire but it could be any of the other um, um, natural disaster uh, you, you pick your environmental media uh, or, or risk and I guess you know for me I you know I've also like Chris I think and, and uh, Brian have also been involved in everything from war games with the Pentagon dealing with environmental security to the Forest Service with after, after action um, deep dives into particular incidents and then okay now let's use those contexts to try to um, project for similar uh, uh, cases and, and how would you proceed differently. For me, uh, with respect to the equity issue, what I'm really interested in with simulations or with exercises for Chris is asking is if you kind of recognize that with major disasters, the folks who tend to be, who really take it on the nose are folks who are in a lower income type of household setting. And if that's an essential part of your normative framework, in other words, equity and fairness really matters in terms of our, what are we focusing on here? Then if you and superimpose on that a sort of a precautionary principle and imagine doing a set of interventions to promote resilience as we've been talking about here and then run your simulation, run your wildfire uh, and, and how we address a, a set of um, a, a wildfire scenario or a, uh, a nor'easter or uh, a cat five hurricane or whatever. We proceed that with attention to the resilience factor that's where I think the most valuable um, work can be done in, in, in terms of projection and forecast. But that assumes a priori that, that equity really matters. Chris, did, did you want to follow up here or? or well, or, yeah, yeah, I would just have a quick response to, uh, to the question or the, the comments about human agency, right? Um, and these are sort of oftentimes the hidden variables um, in, in, in understanding uh, how human behavior, and I, I go back to sort of Thaler and Sunstein's uh, work on nudging, for example. And I think this is, we need to come back to behavioral science as part of this team science approach to, to looking at this, which is how is risk communication, risk, how are risk communication and messages received by different segments of the population, right? Uh, the spread reduction, this spread infection reduction models uh, that were, were predicting uh, the the disease spread, um, you know, a critique of them is that they it, they they did not necessarily take into consideration the heterogeneity of the human population um, and how people would actually respond to different risk messaging. I mean, I don't think anyone could have could have anticipated the politicization of of, of masking and vaccinations to the to quite the extent that we have, but. But we need to start thinking about how human beings respond to policy interventions and policy tools and have that be a part of this equation. Um, and that may then help to anticipate um, the response uh, landscape. And, and, and similarly, we need to understand how the institutional responses and predis predispositions and, and incorporate those into our, our, our frameworks and model thinking um, in order to overcome the and reduce those barriers and really look at incentives uh, at the institutional scales as well. So that would just be my, my, my point. And there, we're doing a lot more work, I think, in the behavioral sciences to, to study um, using behavioral experiments in simulated environments. And, and there are scenarios and artificial, but to see how people would respond to certain kinds of scenarios, we can take the probability distributions of those behaviors and then incorporate them into uh, more sophisticated models and actually try to get at that stochastic signal of human behavior. And I think we're headed in this direction um, as generally as a field. And I think we need to be thinking about this in terms of our policy and governance design. Hey, just to follow up on something you just said, is there is there a body knowledge on behavioral sciences applied to collaboration or like community outreach and collaboration? Because I, you know, the my comment about just having great data and present presenting it to people if it's opaque, if it's presented at the 11th hour and people 
are just suspicious at that point, you know, there's a context when you present data, right? So that how that data and message will be received matters. And that that's got to be in a context of a broader community engagement. So I'm, you know, in, in the risk informed decision making, you know, collaboration is a big piece of that. So I'm, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges DOE faces in its cleanup mission is that managing well that collaboration element. So I'd be curious if there's any lessons to be learned in that in that space. I'd open it up to the rest of the, the panel. I, I could respond to that, but anyone else want to chime in on that? If not, I will. Go ahead, Chris, and then um, okay. and then I have a, a, a question or two from the field. There's one in particular I want to ask. Uh, so, okay. uh, but but please please go ahead. Okay. So I you know I think it was Brian that mentioned public goods, right, and and common pool resources, and private goods, and this is where game theory can come in handy as well, where we look at iterated prisoners' dilemmas. Um, and how uh, consensus can be built over time. Um, and, and basically the, the, the long and the short of that is, is in generative repeated uh, interactions with people that matter. And, and over time, uh, trust begins to emerge or at least a tit for tat um, of that we're in this together and that we need to better coordinate our activities. Um, and I think, how do we then in, in, our, in our governance design, how do we create those fora for those kind of consistent interactions. And the big challenge that was mentioned several times is the scenario planning gets all the actors in the room, um, but, but, but it's episodic, right? I mean, it, it, it's a one shot prisoner's dilemma game uh, that, and they, they're also gaming it, right? Of course, I'm gonna collaborate in real life. I mean, in, in a scenario, but maybe not in real life. But if you look at, uh, I'm thinking of Naeem Kapuku's work on emergency response and some of his findings of, about why Florida responds to hurricanes more readily than, than, uh, than the Gulf Coast, for example, the you know, Louisiana and whatnot, and that may be changing. This was, I'm thinking about five or 10 years ago, um, even longer, but it was the repeated nature of the frequency of the hurricanes that allowed for those pathways to be stimulated. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, is again, in the complexity space and the emergence and self-organization is through um, diffusion of, of ideas and the viral nature of information flows that we're seeing all the time with social media. The question, I think, for the policy and governance space is, we've got to harness those tools for the greater good. And I, I think we need to stop worrying too much about sort of the paternal nature of this because if we're not doing it for the greater good with those public goods in mind, then someone else is gonna do it and we're, and we're seeing the end results. So we need to get into that game with an accountability structure that's democratically anchored and transparent so that we as a society can, can continue you know, maintaining a, a level of quality of life and, and stability for our civilization. So anyway, that's my comment. Nice, nice uh, comments there. Um, I, I wanted to um, ask a question here, bring it back to uh, some of the uh, concerns of GAO and more generally the auditing community. And, I, and we, got a, we got an interesting question here. Um, David Trimble gave examples of emerging criteria such as the Green Book, Cost Estimation Guide, Risk-Informed Decision-Making on the one hand, and then Brian Gerber talked about um, rethinking um, governance and thinking about scale and jurisdiction on the other and and so how the question that we got was what should the accountability community be doing to help decision makers define break down and address these these complex challenges that we're facing and that's that's really a question to everybody not just the GAO people but but our external researchers and experts as well. I, I have an idea. This is Chris Curry. Um, so I think that, you know, we're talking about really big pie in the sky theoretical things for most people, including politicians. And um, you know, I don't think anyone like disagrees with anything that's been said today. No one would disagree that 
we need to do a better job on looking at this from a systems approach or, you know, no, no one's going to say that's a bad idea. I think, I think what's hard is making this tangible for people. And I'll use an example of disaster resilience and risk reduction. You know, I think what we've tried to do is use the numbers to our benefit to push policy change, like by explaining to people the types, the, the amount of damage that, that you're going to, you know, you're going to take if, if you don't do these things. And, you know, the infrastructure that's going to be impacted, how much that's going to cost and how long it's going to be offline and what sort of economic damage that's going to do to your community. And, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt and show them that that will happen if this scenario plays out in your community. I think that and, and as Chris said, the repeated disasters helps, too, <laughs> um, because some, when somebody has to face something every three or four years, like the poor folks in southern Louisiana, things get real and they take action. I think that's, I think that's one place where, the, where we can use data and information on costs and spending um, to make these things more real for people and not just theoretical issues. Thanks, Chris. Um, anybody else had something to add there? Yeah, I'll just say real quick in that, um, you know, I think the, the guide you know, are really what what we're trying to do there in terms of helping agencies. You know, I think the so the risk informed decision making that's really sort of the you know for years we, the recommendations to DOE to you know prioritize deal risk based approach right. But then it was like, well, you know, how, how do you actually do that in practice? Because there's all sorts of you know risk based requirements in in NEPA and you know and all the other laws they have to follow. But what does it mean in the context of the problems they tackle? And so the framework is really is that guide. And I think applying it in the context of our audits sort of brings that to life and, and provides provides a roadmap. Matt. I would just add that um, back to the topic of urgency, that, that the likelihood with the environmental context that we've been talking about with disaster management. Um, your audits are likely to, urgency is likely to rise to the top. Um, this notion, and I, which I, I totally agree with Chris, there is very interesting um, experimental research with um, repeat games and you discover in a prisoner's dilemma that you get cooperation. However, it's important, I think, to put on top of that, the prospects of irreversibilities was some of the topics that we're talking about here. So an interesting trend with wildfire, after two or three fire seasons in a very comparatively wealthy county and region of California, we see an exodus of, of folks from Sonoma. Sonoma, heck, I'd like to have a second home in Sonoma, right? It's wine country. Well, the folks who are leaving Sonoma can't afford to leave. Who's left? And so we're back to this equity issue again. I would expect that you would find those communities over time are going to become more, if you will, fire adapted and resilient. But there's a fairness question. So I, I, I have this sense moving forward that the audits that you perform are going to be, it'll just be unavoidable uh, to address these equity issues. Okay, we are just about at the end here. I'm, uh, I'm going to um, thank all of you for uh, participating in this uh, really interesting panel. And um, I, to the audience, um, we, will, we do have a recording of this that will be available on the internet. Um, I'll be sending out information to the addressees of of this original uh, panel invite. And um, I likely will also be sending around the slides. But once again, to all the panelists, thank you so much for your participation. I really enjoyed this panel. And uh, good day to you all and to the audience. Thank you. Bye. Right, thank you. Go Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go Cubs. <laughs>
<laughs> had to get that in, David. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to refer to you forevermore as merely sturdily. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you like the August September joke? I did. I did. I chuckled. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad. <laughs> thanks. Thanks again, David. That was uh, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, David. Bye -bye. Take care. Yeah. See you, David. Brian. Thanks. Bye. -bye.